Hello, guys. Nice to see you. Good afternoon. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Hi. Uh, last. Uh, good afternoon. Hello, everyone who has joined. Nice to see you guys. <clears throat> so last discussion uh, we spent trying to uh, get into the concept of parallel access theorem. So the option to calculate uh, the moment of inertia um, of uh, any body when uh, moment of inertia uh, of uh, with respect to the center of mass is known. So it's quite convenient in that case. Uh, also, we discussed in uh, details the rolling rigid object. So when we have a combination of uh, both uh, translational and uh, rotational uh, motions, uh, so we also deal with two components of uh, its kinetic energy, which should be taken into account, for instance, when uh, you consider um, rolling a rigid object on the inclined plane. Uh, so the uh, velocity of the uh, translational velocity of the center of mass uh, would be, in that case, um, different from just a sliding uh, block without rotation because part of um, initial potential energy should be redistributed uh, between uh, kinetic energy of rotational and translational motions. So today we continue this uh, topic uh, within this week of uh, rotating um, rigid bodies, and uh, we will introduce um, the equivalent of force uh, for translational motion um, in rotational motion, which is torque, uh, and uh, uh, show how it's related to um, angular um, acceleration of the body. Uh, and uh, the, at the end of our discussion today, we will also introduce another important concept, which is uh, angular momentum and conservation of angular momentum. Okay, so let me switch the screen and we can start. <clears throat> so, uh, so far we have shown that uh, there is quite uh, similar kinematic equations, uh, like system of kinematic equations uh, for rotational motion with constant angular acceleration in comparison to translational motion with constant acceleration. Um, it has the same structure but different um, parameters which we use for description of these uh, motions. Uh, and uh, obviously uh, in the question of dynamics of uh, rotational motion, we also need to deal with some um, parameters which uh, are sim similar by uh, concept to uh, parameters in dynamics of translational motion, which is uh, force. And also we uh, were dealing with uh, linear uh, momentum. So here in the rotational case, we will deal with uh, torque instead of force and uh, angular momentum. So let us consider some uh, bolt for a model system with a center in point O and uh, some wrench.
So this range is aligned along axis x. And there is some force which is applied to the edge of the range at some angle. So this is force F, some angle, let's call it angle phi. So now if we want to describe the um, effect of this force uh, in terms of rotating this system about axis which goes through the uh, point O, uh, then we need to introduce a, a new parameter I mentioned about uh, torque. So here, so far, we will just deal with absolute values. And uh, um, torque is actually, in general, defined as a product, a vector product of uh, two vectors is position vector. It's this guy uh, position of the point where force is applied with respect to the origin and uh, also uh, force vector. So then absolute value of torque will be equal to uh, uh, R uh, position vector magnitude times force magnitude times sinus of this angle phi. Uh, from other point of view, if we extrapolate some line which goes through the uh, force F, force vector F, and then uh, we'll put down a perpendicular to this uh, line, straight line from the origin, so here we have 90 degrees. Uh, this, uh, let's call this segment, uh, this perpendicular D. So that will be equal to F times D because R times uh, sinus phi. So you see phi, this angle here, we have right triangular and um, this uh, D will be equal to R uh, times sinus E. <clears throat> so this uh, D uh, is called moment uh, arm or uh, lever arm uh, of force F with respect to the origin O. So that's how we define uh, effect of applied force in terms of rotational, uh, on its uh, effect on rotational motion. And uh, um, units for torque is Newton meter. And please don't mess it up with um, the work because it's also Newton times meter, but here it has a completely different physical meaning. So it's like force multiply the uh, moment arm the, uh, of this force with respect to the origin uh, about which the system is uh, rotated. So if we have some system, like let's say some rigid body, and then we have not like more than one forces. Let's say we have this point about which this rigid body can rotate. And uh, let's call it point O. And then we have two forces applied to this rigid body. So let's say one force here and uh, one force here. So then we can uh, put our extrapolate these lines, which go through forces F1 uh, and F2, and uh, build these uh, perpendiculars, which originate at the uh, point about which the system um, tends to rotate. Uh, so we will have here one perpendicular, 
and here one. So this will be uh, D1, this part, and this part will be D2. Moment arm one and moment arm two. And what is important here that you see a uh, torque created by force F1 tends to rotate this uh, rigid body counterclockwise, while torque uh, formed by force two tends to rotate this rigid body clockwise direction. So they are kind of counter uh, acting each other. And uh, uh, if we have a system of um, different forces applied to a rigid body with respect to some axis of rotation, uh, so this uh, uh, torque torques which are formed by these uh, forces with respect to the uh, axis of rotation, then we need to have some uh, calculate some net torque uh, applied to this rigid body. And uh, that will be uh, sum of all torques uh, applied to the body with respect to the axis of rotation. So here will be torque one plus torque two. And uh, taking into account the fact that uh, they are uh, they tend to rotate the rigid body in different uh, directions. Then we can write, uh, we said one direction is positive. For instance, F1 times D1 uh, is positive. And then the uh, other direction will be negative, it will be F2 uh, times D2. Okay, so now let us consider uh, a rigid body under net torque uh, and uh, describe its its uh, uh, motion. So in order to do that, we have this rigid body. Then we pick up some origin point with respect to which, uh, like about which this uh, torque will be calculated. Then we have our system of coordinates, X and Y. And let us pick up some small element of this rigid body with uh, mass dm, like very small mass. So uh, there is some force exerted on this small element of mass, and we will call it uh, DF uh, T, because this is so-called tangential uh, force, uh, because it is aligned in parallel to the tangent of the trajectory of this body. So if it uh, rotates about axis, which goes through this point O, um, then this element uh, of mass dm will uh, have some uh, circular uh, trajectory. And at this point, this force is um, aligned in that way that it's uh, in parallel to the tangent of the uh, trajectory of this uh, small element dm uh, in given moment of time. Okay, so we know that uh, this tangential uh, force applied to this small element of the rigid body uh, can be represented as according to the second law of uh, motion as this small element mass dm times a t, uh, tangential acceleration. Uh, <clears throat> so it's not uh, 
centripetal acceleration, gentle acceleration, which uh, originates from the change of the linear velocity vector uh, magnitude, not direction. So uh, now we can uh, represent the, the torque, this very small torque, which uh, will be created by this tangential force uh, DFT. Uh, with respect to the origin of this system of uh, coordinates. So this is our um, radius uh, position vector. So now, since uh, there is a right angle between the force and the position vector, uh, we can write for uh, the torque, which we will call external torque, uh, because we have some external force exerted, exerted on this uh, body, uh, will be equal to um, radius, like distance from the small element dm to the origin point uh, times dft. So we don't have sinus uh, alpha or phi, uh, because uh, here is right angle, so sinus of 90 degrees will be unit. And we can uh, continue further, so we substitute uh, dft with its expression according to second law of motion. So it will be at, uh, tangential acceleration, times r, times dm. So at this point, we need to recall how um, linear uh, velocity and acceleration um, are related to angular velocity and acceleration. So we remember from previous discussions that uh, linear velocity is equal to radius times omega, which is angular velocity. And uh, subsequently, we can go for uh, this tangential acceleration which is equal to dv over dt, as I mentioned, originates from the change of magnitude of the uh, linear velocity vector. And that will be radius times d omega over dt. And uh, instead of d omega over dt, we can operate with our angular um, acceleration. So it will be r times alpha. Uh, <clears throat> so now we can uh, substitute instead of AT, its expression in terms of radius and angular acceleration. And for this uh, small torque of external force um, exerted on a small element dm will be given as follows. It will be uh, alpha times r square times dm. So we have one r here, and now the r comes from here. We get alpha times r square times dm. Okay. Uh, so another thing that uh, uh, we need to recall here that since um, this is a rigid body. If this small element dm is moving with some angular acceleration alpha, that automatically means that any other small element of this rigid body will move with the same angular um, acceleration. So now in order to get the total exerted, um, uh, the total uh, torque, uh, external torque, uh, which originates from um, like many different uh, exerted uh, forces on uh, all small elements of this rigid body from outside. Uh, with respect to this origin uh, O, we need to integrate the uh, last uh, equation. So it will be, uh, let's call it like sum of so external will be equal 
to integral alpha r square dm. So as we mentioned above, um, alpha remains uh, constant for any chosen small element of this uh, rigid body. Sorry. And uh, uh, that's why we can put it out from the integral. So it will be alpha times r square dm. So here we see that this part is nothing else as the moment of inertia of the rigid body with respect to this origin, uh, like uh, through which the axis of rotation is uh, going through. So uh, that's why we write that total external torque on this uh, rigid body with respect to origin O um, will be equal to a moment of inertia times angular acceleration. So that is an important uh, relationship. Uh, so that you should definitely remember and uh, can be um, necessary for uh, solving different problems. Uh, also, we so far, we're talking only about um, absolute values of torque, wherever it is a vector quantity. So maybe let's clean this part here. And uh, that's why if we have a um, system of coordinates, like in three dimensions, will be x, y, and z. Then we have some, for instance, some point where the force is inserted, f vector. Then here is the radius vector, if we extrapolate it here. So there will be some angle, um, let's call it angle theta, between uh, position vector and force vector. And then uh, torque as a vector is equal to vector product of position vector and force. So that means we will have torque vector uh, aligned along axis Z uh, perpendicular to the plane where um, vector uh, R and vector F are uh, placed. So this is the uh, comment on uh, vector nature of this uh, torque uh, and uh, the way how we get the orientation of torque uh, when uh, position vector and uh, force vector are given. So at this point, I think we can proceed uh, further and go to the uh, introduction of angular uh, momentum. So this is one of the also main parameters for rotational uh, motion. And as you remember, uh, not so long time ago, we were dealing with uh, uh, linear momentum. So it was linear momentum vector is equal to mass time linear velocity. So, <clears throat> Uh, force uh, was also possible to like some net force, uh, which is applied to a uh, body could be represented as the first derivative of the uh, linear moment uh, vector. So now we deal with uh, rotational motion. And we need to introduce another parameter, which is angular momentum. 
So again, if we, let's start from vector nature of angular momentum, because it actually very important and uh, defines the behavior of some uh, bodies with complex motion, like gyroscope, for instance. So if we have some point with mass m, it moves. So there is some uh, velocity vector and means automatically uh, linear momentum vector p. Then here is the position vector, which defines position of this uh, body with respect to the origin of the system of coordinates. Then there is this angle theta between two vectors and the moment of um, like angular momentum vector will be also in as similar to a uh, previous case with uh, the torque will be uh, aligned uh, perpendicular to the plane of vectors R and P. Uh, so angular momentum is marked as capital L. This is equal to vector product of position vector and linear momentum vector. So uh, let us consider this in, uh, in terms of torque and how it relates um, the um, change of linear uh, so of angular momentum vector with uh, net torque acting on the body. So we know that if some net force is acting on the body, there is some change in uh, linear momentum vector. Automatically, that means that uh, if there is some external a net torque acting on a rigid body, um, there will be some change in the uh, angular momentum of this uh, uh, body. So we know that the net external torque is equal to the radius times net. Oops, external force applied to this body. So it's a vector uh, product and we can write it in a bit different form, uh, taking into account this relationship between uh, net force and um, change in uh, linear moment. So it will be R vector times dP vector over dT. So now what we will do, uh, let us add to this part another component, which will be dr over dt, uh, vector product with vector p. So we can add it here because this product will be equal to zero. So why it equals to zero? Can you tell me, please? Any ideas? We have vector product of first derivative of position vector and linear momentum vector. And I claim that this will be equal to zero. Do you know why? So what is first derivative of position vector? Velocity. Velocity vector, you are right. So in other 
form, we can write the same product as velocity vector, multiply linear momentum vector. And what do we know? That linear momentum vector is mass times velocity vector means that velocity vector is parallel to linear momentum vector. If they are parallel, then alpha or some, let's say, I don't know, theta angle between these two vectors will be equal to zero degrees. And that means that sinus of this angle theta, which is equal to zero, will be equal to zero. So this product dr over dt times uh, p uh, will be equal to zero. So we can add, subtract this product. We can do everything what we want because eventually it will be uh, uh, zero. So let us do it. <clears throat> so now the net work vector will be equal to r vector times d p over d t. Then let us add this uh, vector product here. Will be dr over dt plus oh, multiply. Let us put it in brackets. Uh, p vector. So according to the rules of uh, like mathematical operations with uh, vector products and uh, also rules of taking derivatives of the product of two functions, we can write that this will be equal to D of vector product R times uh, position vector times linear momentum vector over DT. So it's first derivative of this uh, vector uh, product. Uh, and uh, at this point, we uh, can introduce one more parameter, which is important in rotational moment, uh, <clears throat> uh, which actually, uh, if force, uh, sorry, torque is equivalent of force, uh, in rotational motion, then uh, this parameter in the numerator is uh, actually uh, equivalent of linear momentum because we can introduce uh, this uh, linear uh, angular momentum L, which is product uh, vector product of position vector N. Uh, linear momentum vector, and that will be dl vector over dt. So we uh, wrote that external net force is equal to first derivative of um, linear momentum vector, and here we get the external uh, net torque is equal to uh, first derivative of angular momentum vector. So um, they kind of bring the same uh, concept, but with different uh, parameters and uh, which describe translational and rotational motion. So uh, units for this angular momentum, they are kilogram times square meter and divided by second. Now, let us go to next slide. Uh, if we have some uh, net external torque, vector that will be equal to the change of total angular momentum of the body. And from here, we can say that, okay, this 
total change of angular momentum, d uh, delta angular momentum, delta L, uh, is equal to integral of all uh, net uh, external uh, torque. Oops, external. external torque times dt. Uh, now let us uh, consider angular momentum of a rotating rigid object. So that is, uh, in other words, how we can uh, relate the, how find the relationship between angular momentum uh, moment of inertia of a rigid body and a parameter which like some kinematic parameter uh, which is angular uh, acceleration so let us consider some symmetric case which is a um, disc through the center of this disc we have axis of rotation. This will be some axis Z. Uh, so it rotates, uh, let's say, counterclockwise, and uh, its angular velocity vector will be pointed um, uh, upwards along axis uh, Z. So now at this um, disk, we need to uh, define some small element with mass mi and linear velocity vector v. So this is circular trajectory of this small element. And here will be the radius. Mm. R uh, of this, uh, let's call it Ri, um, position vector, which defines uh, position of uh, this uh, small element Mi with respect to the uh, center of the disk. Uh, taking this into account, we have two vectors, uh, Ri uh, vector V, which is also the same direction for vector P, for linear um, momentum vector. And then from the definition of the angular momentum, here in this specific case, when axis when we have a symmetric body and axis goes through the center uh, of uh, mass of this uh, symmetric body, we can get um, uh, our angular momentum vector, which is parallel to the angular velocity vector omega. It's not general case uh, because if body is not uh, symmetric or the axis of rotation goes through not the center of symmetry of this uh, body, then uh, there will be difference in orientation between angular momentum uh, and uh, angular velocity vector. Uh, so that is uh, true only for so-called principal axis. They exist for any body in this principal axis. Um, which take into account uh, like three-dimensional features of the body uh, density distribution and uh, like matrix of uh, moment of inertia because in general case, it's given by a matrix, not just by a, a number. And uh, for some principal axis, uh, this matrix is given only by um, uh, main uh, 
axis of the matrix, like parameter values are given only main axis of uh, uh, matrix, and all other components of the matrix are equal to zero. So that's kind of mathematical definition of this principal axis. Uh, and in that case, when rotation is going about the principal axis, um, angular momentum vector and angular uh, velocity vector, they coincide. Uh, so that is the case here. We have uh, a simple example here. And uh, uh, now let us, uh, so that is also some uh, angular momentum Li of this particular small uh, part of the disk with the mass Mi. So we can write that Li, this magnitude is equal to Mi times Vi times R. So that is our Vi, linear momentum vector. This is our um, position vector. Uh, so here we don't have any sinus uh, theta because this theta is 90 degrees. So it will be unity. So now we can uh, express uh, linear velocity vector V with uh, like lin let's linear velocity with uh, terms of position vector and angular velocity. So we remember that Vi is equal to Ri times omega. Omega is the same for any point, so we don't put this index i uh, because it's a rigid body, so angular velocity is uh, the same for all parts of the uh, Disk. So then we can, uh, if we substitute here the expression for linear velocity, uh, we will get mi times ri. Instead of vi, we get ri times omega. And eventually we get mi times ri squared times omega. Now, if we want to know the uh, angular momentum of all this disk with respect to axis Z, L with respect to axis Z, will be equal to the sum of all this uh, small angular uh, momentum uh, originated from uh, different small parts of the disk. So here will be sum of m i r i squared times omega for all i. And this part is uh, actually nothing else as moment of inertia with respect to axis z. Uh, so that's why we can write that this will be equal i z times omega. So we have shown uh, that uh, angular momentum uh, of rotating disk or some rigid uh, body in general uh, will be equal to the product of uh, moment of inertia calculated with respect to the axis of rotation and angular velocity vector. So now let us take a first derivative for this uh, angular, like total uh, angular uh, momentum with respect to the axis Z. So it will be DLZ over DT equal to I Z times D omega over dt, and this is equal to i z times alpha. So we see that the change of the angular momentum is equal to the product of the uh, moment of inertia with respect to axis of rotation times angular acceleration. And we know from uh, 
previous uh, discussion that this will be equal to the net uh, external torque exerted on the rigid body. So now we have this uh, relationship between uh, change of uh, angular momentum uh, moment of inertia with respect to the axis of rotation, angular acceleration, and uh, net torque. Uh, <clears throat> so this is uh, pretty much everything what I wanted to tell you for today. Uh, any questions? So we consider no to the, uh, two uh, important parameters in uh, dynamics of um, rotational motion. So that one, the first one is uh, uh, torque, which is equivalent of force for uh, rotational motion as force in translational motion. Um, and uh, define how to calculate it, uh, how this uh, torque uh, is uh, related to um, angular acceleration via uh, moment of inertia. So it's actually second law of motion for translation for rotational motion, uh, <clears throat> because instead of mass, we use moment of inertia instead of acceleration, linear acceleration, angular acceleration. Uh, and also we introduced a new uh, concept of uh, angular momentum. So it's analog of linear momentum in um, our um, previous discussions. And, oh, okay, one thing we need to add. So maybe I switch back. Uh, to my screen, we need to discuss also this uh, feature uh, conservation of angular moment. That's another important thing. I forgot about this. So if our external torque is equal to zero, that means that the change of angular momentum is also equal to zero. Means that the total, so it's total angular momentum, that the total angular momentum for closed system, isolated system, will remain constant. So that is also um, valid for linear momentum. So we have this conservation of linear and conservation of angular moment. That means if, for instance, we had uh, some initial moment of inertia and initial angular velocity, which gives us the, uh, so the product gives us the, uh, moment of uh, angular momentum. Then we change the uh, moment of inertia. We got some final moment of inertia because of changing the shape of the body, uh, like distribution of the mass. Uh, then obviously, according to this uh, conservation of uh, angular momentum, the angular velocity should be also changed. So we can, uh, for instance, consider some classical example of uh, two stars. Uh, one is normal star with large radius and another after supernova exposure, uh, radius shrinks a lot, but mass is not lost so much. And so we can assume that uh, mass of the star remains constant, but radius of the neutron star as a result of this supernova explosion 
becomes much small. So then if we write, so moment of inertia of a sphere is two over five uh, total mass times uh, initial radius square. Then for instance, we have period, we know period of rotation about its axis. So it will be uh, two pi divided by E initial, initial uh, period of rotation. So we can write omega as two pi divided by T initial. Then it will be equal to two fifths M. And here we have already small radius of the neutron star, R squared times two pi E final. So if now we cancel this and this, uh, also this two pi, we can easily show that final period of rotation will be uh, radius of the neutron star divided by radius of the normal star before this transformation, square times initial period of rotation. So uh, since R uh, radius of the neutron star is much smaller than the radius of normal star, uh, obviously that um, this period of uh, rotation will be much smaller than initial period of rotation means that the neutron star will rotate extremely fast, uh, like revolutions per, per minute or per second will be much uh, higher angular uh, velocity. So this is a, a short uh, discussion of the conservation of angular momentum, which definitely can be useful for uh, different applications. Okay. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and uh, uh, have a good weekend. Take care. See you on Monday when we start new topic. Okay. Thank you. Goodbye. Yes, it will be great. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Mm -hmm. Have a good day. Bye-bye.